What if you could make a cheap bass feel and sound as good as a thousand dollar axe? So one of these basses cost 300 and one of them cost a thousand. Could you tell which was which? You probably think more money is better when it comes to basses, but most of the things making your cheapo bass sound sh and hard to play, you can actually fix in just a few minutes with a basic bass setup. In this video, I'll show you how to make your sh bass play like a dream in five easy steps, and we'll see if we can fool an experienced bassist into liking a cheap bass as much as a pricey one. Without a good setup, your bass just sucks to play. You might have notes that buzz, rattle, and sound out of tune, not enough volume, or too much volume, or strings a mile off the fretboard that hurt your fingers ow, to press down. Ow, ow, ow. So what is a setup? It's a maintenance process that involves adjusting the neck, the bridge, the nut, and the pickups. The goal is to get the bass super playable with clean, in-tune notes all over the neck. Just like your car needs a regular service to not blow up, every bass needs a setup periodically, no matter if you paid $100 or $1,000 for it. Doing your own basic setup like this is super safe, I promise you won't break anything, unless you like drop your bass, in which case that's clearly on you. Just follow these five steps in order and your bass should play like a dream. All you'll need is a ruler, a screwdriver, a couple Allen wrenches, a tuner, and just a little bit of patience. I'm super curious to see if I can trick Geo into liking the cheap bass as much as this expensive one. A truss rod that's not set properly will either give you gnarly buzzing or strings way far off the neck that are hard to press down. Ugh. So step one is to tweak your truss rod to get just enough forward bow in the neck for buzz-free playing. The truss rod is a metal rod hidden in the neck of your bass that balances the tension of the strings. It's super easy to check if your truss rod is set correctly in three easy steps. The truss rod test trifecta! First, hold the bass in playing position and press the E string down right behind the first fret wire. You can use a capo if you have one, or just wedge in a big triangle pick, a ruler, or any thin and fairly rigid object. Second, with your plucking hand, press the E string down past the 12th fret wire, or what we would usually call the 13th fret. And third, check your truss rod status by measuring the gap between the E string and the seventh fret wire. You can use a normal business card to measure for the right gap. Just slide it between the string and the fret wire. If you can't get it in, the string is too close to the fret, which means the neck is too straight, and you'll need to loosen the truss rod to let it bow forward more. If there's more than one to two business cards of clearance, there's too much forward bow in the neck, and you'll need to tighten the truss rod to straighten it out. Alternate third step, instead of the business card method, you can tap the E string lightly against the seventh fret wire with your finger, and you should hear a little clicking sound. Bass setup ASMR. If you don't hear anything, the string is already touching the fret, which means the neck is too straight and you need to loosen the truss rod. If there's a lot of string travel and a lot of clicking sound, there's too much forward bow in the neck and you need to tighten the truss rod. So how do you do that? Three steps again. First, find where your truss rod adjust is. It might be on the headstock like it is on this bass. It might be at the body end of the neck like on a Music Man. And if you're unlucky enough to have a vintage style neck like this one, you actually have to remove the neck to access the adjustment. Is that really an important part of the vintage reissue? And depending on where it is, you might need to loosen a couple strings to get access. Second, find the thicker Allen wrench that came with your bass, or just find one that fits perfectly. Just make sure there's no wiggle because you really don't want to strip that nut. By the way, I used to be terrified of truss rod adjustments. I'd heard all these scary stories about stripped nuts and broken rods and economic downturn. But if you don't act like an idiot, truss rod adjustments are super safe and easy. So the third and final step is to tighten or loosen your truss rod depending on how your check went. Either way, start this step by loosening it an eighth of a turn at first to de-stick it and then turn it back to where you started. If it's really stuck, it might need some oil, but I've never had that issue personally. If you found you had too much forward bow in your check, you'll need to tighten the truss rod by turning clockwise. Do this an eighth turn or so at a time. It doesn't usually take much. And it's normal to use fairly firm pressure, but if you're forcing it or making huge turns, you can cause problems. And if you didn't have enough bow in your check and the neck was too straight, loosen the truss rod by turning counterclockwise, again, just an eighth turn or so to start. Now you need to retune your strings and recheck your truss rod using the truss rod test trifecta. Your bass always needs to be in tune before you take any measurements. And remember to check the truss rod and everything else in playing position, meaning the orientation you use while actually playing, not laying on a workbench. If you're getting one to two business cards of clearance now, your truss rod is all set. If it's still off, you might need to try another eighth turn or two. Truss rod tweaks take hours to settle in, so make small adjustments. Take a break to click the like button and subscribe to Bass Buzz, and measure again later for fine tuning. We've made good progress, but there's no way we're fooling Geo at this point. Because the truss rod is the critical first step, but you probably won't see much difference in how your bass feels until you finish step two. 
So you've dialed your truss rod, but if your bridge saddles aren't set correctly, your strings might still be rattling and buzzing away, or still in a long distance relationship with the neck. Yep, step two is to adjust your bridge saddles. Get this right and you'll be in business with the strings right where you want them. Enough height that you can pluck decently hard without buzz while still being close enough to the neck that it feels good to play. Bridge saddles are these little doohickeys the strings rest on on the body side of the bass. They determine your action, and action just means how far the strings are from the fretboard. This is also determined by the truss rod, but the easiest and most direct adjustment to your action is usually here at the bridge saddle. So what kind of action do you want? High action? Low action? As usual, you'll find an abundance of strong opinions on the internet. With low action, the strings are super close to the neck, and you have to play with a very light touch to avoid buzz. With high action, the strings are further off and harder to press down, but you have a lot more bandwidth for plucking volume. For me as a bass teacher, I'd like you to learn on something like medium action, where the strings are low enough that they're easy to press down, but high enough that you can pluck decently hard without getting rattling. How do you check your action? First, get the bass in playing position and fret or capo at the first fret. Now grab your ruler and measure from the top of the 12th fret wire to the bottom of the E string. Something like a two to three millimeter gap on the E string is a good medium starting point, or around three thirty seconds of an inch. You can also check the G string while you're at it, which can be slightly lower since the string is smaller. Just make a mental note at this point whether your strings were too high or too low. And remember that the order of these setup steps is important. Your truss rod adjustment also affects this measurement, so get that set before you start on your bridge saddles. Adjusting the bridge saddles is pretty easy, another three-step wonder. One, find the smaller Allen wrench that came with your base, or just find one that fits your bridge saddles. Two, figure out how your bridge saddles like to be adjusted, because there are different kinds of bridge design. On this super simple fender style bridge, the Allen wrench just goes straight in. On some bridges, like on my PV Cirrus, you might need to loosen a locking screw before you adjust. And three, make the adjustments. If your E string was too low, you'll want to turn clockwise, which drives the screw further down into the base, raising the saddle. If your E string was too high, turn counterclockwise, which pulls the screw up and lowers the saddle. I used to find this part so confusing, but maybe it's just me. Adjust something like a quarter or half turn at a time and keep the bridge saddles even, so if you do a half turn on one side, do a half turn on the other. Before you check your adjustment, retune the string because it'll go flat or sharp depending on how you adjusted the bridge saddle. Then just fret at the first fret and measure again. Once you're in that two to three millimeter range, try plucking every fret on that string with medium to hard intensity. You're looking for rattle-free notes, and if you find some rattle, make sure you're pressing at the end of the fret with enough pressure to eliminate your technique from the equation. If you're consistently getting buzz on multiple frets, you need to raise the action a bit. If it's clean and you want to try dropping the action lower, you can. Just remember to retune before checking every time so the string has the right tension. Once you're happy with the E string, repeat this process for the G string and then the A and the D. Because there's a slight curve to the fingerboard of a bass, the A and the D strings, the inner strings, should be slightly higher than the outer strings, the E and the G. This is almost enough to fool Geo into thinking this bass is more expensive than it is, but there's one final step to dialing dreamy action, step three. Truss rod terrific, bridge saddle set. Fretted notes feeling good, but without this third step, your open strings could still be a mess. If your nut slots are too low, you'll get buzzy, rattly open strings. <laughs> too high and it messes with your action and intonation. So step three is to check the nut to make sure you've got just the right amount of clearance. This is the slightly wonky part of the five step setup because you can't actually fix nut issues on your own without special tools, but it's still worth diagnosing so you know if you need to take it to a pro. Checking your nut height is super easy. Just put the bass in playing position, grab that business card again, and without fretting or pressing anything, slide it between the strings and the first fret wire. If it slides perfectly under all the strings, you're golden. If it's too tight to fit under any string, that string's nut slot is low. If the open string doesn't rattle, it's not actually a problem, but if it does, you need some pro assistance. If there's a lot of clearance between the string and the card, the nut slot is too high and needs to be recut, which requires special files and know-how. Again, take it to a pro. Wouldn't you say the most important part of a bass setup is liking this video and subscribing to Bass Buzz? Tell me what, again, what the most important thing about a bass setup is? You know, there's a lot of things that are important about a bass setup. But the most important thing about a bass setup is liking and subscribing to Bass Buzz. Now the action of your bass is fully dialed and it's time to make sure that you don't sound out of tune like a dummy. Frets are a pretty handy thing. They make it so that no matter where you put your fingers on the neck, you can only play in tune notes. Unlike a fretless bass where you can play all kinds of bizarre out of tune crap. 
But frets only work the way they're supposed to if the string is exactly the right length. If the string is too short, your notes will get sharper as you go up the neck. If the string is too long, your notes will get flatter as you go up the neck. Either way, you sound like a mess, even if you tuned up your open strings perfectly. So step four is to dial impeccable intonation by adjusting the individual string lengths at the bridge saddle, so your notes are in tune everywhere on the neck. Remember you need your truss rod, bridge saddle height, and nut set first, because they all subtly affect string length, and that's why this step is fourth. So how do you check your intonation? First, plug into a quality tuner and tune your open string. We're gonna start with the G string, but it doesn't matter. Second, fret the 12th fret, which on this string should also be a G, and see if that's also in tune on the tuner, which it is not. And make sure you don't bend the string with your fretting finger like this, because that's obviously gonna blow your measurements. Step 2.5, I also like to check the 19th fret to get another data point. So on the G string, that should be a D. So just fret without bending, pluck at a medium volume, and check the tuning. If the open string, 12th fret, and 19th fret are all in tune, your intonation is spot on for that string. If your fretted notes were flat, like mine, you'll need to shorten the string so the frets have a bigger effect on the pitch. If your notes were sharp, you'll need to lengthen the string so the frets have a smaller effect on the pitch. It took me an embarrassing number of setups to stop getting confused at this part, so if you're confused at this part, it's all good, there will be visuals. So how do you adjust intonation? On most bridges, it's a simple Phillips head screw that you turn to scoot the bridge saddle backwards or forwards. If your fretted notes were flat, you need to loosen the screw counterclockwise to make the string shorter. If they were sharp, you need to tighten the screw clockwise to make the string longer. Lift or loosen the string as you adjust to help the saddle move without so much downward pressure. Or else you might scrape up your bridge like I did on the old Bass Buzz Squire. Sorry, buddy. After adjusting, you might need to tap tap the end of your screwdriver while in the screw head to make sure the head of the screw didn't lift away from the bridge. Every single time you make an adjustment, retune the open string before you check the fretted notes and make sure you're not bending when you're fretting. So adjust, tune, check your fretted notes, repeat the process until everything is perfectly in tune and then repeat all that for the other three strings. And don't be surprised if it takes a few rounds per string. Your bass is almost in dream mode, but there's one last piece to make sure it's sounding good out of the amp. Step five, baby. This final step is gonna go a long way to trick Geo into liking the cheap bass. It'll improve the tone and avoid any weird issues. Because without adjusting the pickup height, your bass might feel good to play, but then sound crappy coming out of the amp. Too low and your tone will be thin and quiet. Too high and you'll get distortion and unpleasant pop sounds. So step five is to perfect the pickup height for good tone and good volume. Pickups are these magic blocks created by wizards to transform the vibration of the strings into amplified bass sorcery. Sorry if that was too technical for you. So how high should your pickups be? Closer to the strings, you'll get more volume, more treble, and less sustain. Further from the strings, you'll get less volume, less treble, and more sustain. The right spot is a matter of personal taste as long as you're getting enough volume and the strings aren't banging into the pickups. You can start by checking your pickup height against the manufacturer's specs, which tells you how far they think your pickup should be from the strings, which on these bases is 6 64ths of an inch on the E string side and 5 64ths on the G string side, or 2.5 millimeters on the E string side, 2 millimeters on the G string side. To measure that, press down the string at the last fret and measure from the top of the pull pieces to the bottom of the string. But with pickup height, specs are just a starting point and you can even skip that step if you want to. So to do this the manual way, just start with one pickup soloed. I like to start with the neck pickup on a jazz bass. Then play however heavy you might play. Check your slapping if you like to slap too. If you're getting any distortion or if the strings are hitting the pickup, try lowering it by tightening the screws. If it sounds super quiet and feels too far away, raise it up by loosening the screws. Once you have your first pickup set, you can solo back and forth the two pickups to make sure the volume is matched. So here's neck, here's bridge. Sounds pretty good to me. Then test them blended together and see how you like the sound. 
Again, as long as you're getting relatively even volume from the two pickups, you like how it sounds and the strings aren't banging into the pickups, you really can't go wrong here. Special note if you have a precision bass pickup, because I often hear from students who think they have two pickups when they really have one split pickup like the P pickup. And the split pickup is designed to match the curvature of the fingerboard, so the inside edges should be slightly raised to get even performance across all the strings. All right, these basses are dialed. Let's see if the setup stuff actually makes a difference. I'm gonna go find Gio and blindfold his ass. So Gio, what are we doing here today? I have no idea. And now I'm in a room surrounded by cameras. Try snapping your fingers. That's so amazing. Oh, there's a strap and a base attached to it. It's like really fat. It sounds great. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a nice, plain, great sounding bass. If you had to gig on that bass, what would your happiness level be? Yeah, I'd be I'd be okay with that. I think. Oh, I like the heft. This is more what I was looking for. Does it play good? Where are the frets, Josh? Where are the frets? <laughs> Precision. This feels, I feel like I'm driving a Cadillac a little bit. Oh, dude, this is like a high fidelity precision thing and it just feels well made. So one of these bases cost 300 and one of them cost 1000. Could you tell which was which? Um, yes, but I couldn't tell until you gave me the second bass. When you gave me bass number one, I was super stoked to be playing on that bass. It sounded great, it felt good. But this one, this bass has, uh, it's a totally different feeling in your hands. Dun dun, dun dun dun. Oh my God. Okay, first my eyes have to adjust to the light. Yeah, like visually, no. Can you tell? No. And it wasn't until you gave me this bass that I was like, oh, that first bass like wasn't, that wasn't the one, that wasn't great. Yeah. I never knew how to set up my own bases, and so it was a hack and slash adventure um, until I could afford taking it to people who could do it. And being able to do it on your own so that you can adjust it for exactly what you want on your base, that's, that's huge, that's super important. Actually, and now, these are my own words, and that's worth clicking like and subscribe on these videos because that's power, that's power for you, and then you can play your bases the way that you want, and you can always fix them, and you don't have to pay somebody else to do it.